will not leave this place the same way we came. Hallowed be your holy name, our Father. We bless you, Lord, because you are God. Oh, hallowed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for ordering our stuff in this place. We thank you because it is according to your plan and purpose that you have brought us to this place at this time. We could have been somewhere else, but you brought us to this place at this time. We are so certain about the things you want to do tonight. We we'll give you thanks for it. We we'll thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are in this place. We are sure because you said so. He said, wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. And so we are very much convinced that you are here with us. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before you take your seat, can you just raise your Bible up if you're here with your Bible? If you're here with your Bible, just raise it up. Are you here with your Bible? Just read it up. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. Now, as we're saying this thing, I wanted to know what we are actually saying and mean it. Are you getting me? We are not just doing recitation. Take note of what we are saying and take the meaning to heart. Are you getting it? It's not a recitation I want you to be doing. Are you getting it? It means something. And that's why you should listen very well as we're saying it. Are you getting it? This is my Bible. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. What it says I, I have. can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I Today can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. Today I will be taught the word I of God. I truly confess. I truly confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, you can have a wonderful seat. It's indeed the word of God that you will be hearing tonight. It's not my word. It is not the president's word, it is not the chaplain's word, it is the word of God. And one thing we are certain about is that God's word, when it is spoken forth, it grows wherever it's land. Are you getting it? God does not speak words, vain words. He does not speak vain words. He doesn't just speak empty words. Whenever God's word is spoken, the word of the Lord says it's like a seed that goes into the soil and then it will, begins to grow and produce its fruits. So I am confident because when I speak God's word, it will produce fruit. And this fruit is changed life. I am very certain that at the end of this meeting tonight, your lives will be transformed better than you came in the name of Jesus. Amen. But one thing I know is that as children of God, we are growing. Are you getting it? God did not give birth to adults. He gave birth to babies initially. And so he's expected that they grow. And that is the reason for meetings like this. Because in meetings like this, it gives us the platform whereby the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, and the evangelists who are the gift of God to the church, they can now take their platform to do the work which God has given them to do. And so I'm excited tonight, and I thank the Lord, and I thank the President for this opportunity to stand before you guys tonight. Because it is a dream come true. It is a prayer come true. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The president may not understand what I'm saying, but it is actually a dream come true to stand before you tonight. I was actually talking to the BSS like two days ago or yesterday. I called him on the phone. Initially, I told him what I wanted to embark on doing. And I called him on the phone, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, when I now started what I decided to do. And I was seeking permission from him that um, he will give me the permission to make use of his platform on WhatsApp and to share what God has laid in my heart to do. And I was also telling him that as his office, he will help me to go and tell the president so that I will have the opportunity also to share what I want to share in the group chat, that is the general group chat. That was just what I told him. And then 
yesterday to this morning, I had a dream of which in the dream I was called upon to do a Bible reading in the church. Praise the Lord. But before, yeah. that day, uh, before I slept that night, I asked the Lord for something. There's still something I'm waiting for the Lord to give me the opportunity to do. But in this dream, I was called upon to do a Bible reading in the church. That was what I was called upon to do in the dream. And then this morning, I decided to share some of the things I wanted to share just to give a highlight on it on my um, WhatsApp or just giving a highlight with the links. And suddenly, the president saw one of the links and then he called me on phone. Is it not a privilege when your president call you on phone? Is it easy? There is a president that called you on phone. No, you call that one. Do you understand? Huh? He called me on phone. When I saw his uh, call, I was so excited. Do you know why I was excited? Not just because it was the president that was calling me, but because he was walking in line of God's will. And then he called me and he said he saw what I posted and that uh, he would like me to speak to the house tonight. This is not a great honor. Can you give the Lord a And so I'm glad to stand before you tonight because I know my standing here is never a mistake. It was God's divine plan that I stand here tonight to speak this word to you. And I know that it is not a mistake that you are here tonight because you could have been somewhere today, you could have been somewhere at this time. But God has ordered your step to this place so that you can hear what I have to say tonight. Because what I have to say is not my words, it's the word that God has put in my mouth. And I thank God for using me as an instrument tonight to speak your word, to speak his word to you. And I know that we will leave here transformed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now what is it that I have backed on lately? I've been experiencing some things in my life. And it is these things that I've been experiencing that made me to take this decision that I took recently to search out the desire of God for our lives. But now this research that I am back on was not really to generalize things, but to personalize it for myself. I wanted to know what God's desire is for me. I wanted to understand what is God's will for my life. I wanted to know how Christ, now I know who God is. Who God is is not a challenge to me. Who Christ is is not a challenge to me. But I want to understand what is God's plan, what is God's will and his desire for my life. I wanted to know how Christ fulfilled this desire. I also wanted to know who I am now and what I have. And that was the reason why I started embarking on this research in the epistles to find out these four things. Praise the Lord. To Are know the real? will of God for my life, to know how Christ fulfilled this will and who I am and uh, what I have. The reason why I embarked on this, I discovered that that is how we grow as children of God. That is how we grow as children of God. You can't grow when you don't know the desire of God for you. When you don't know how Christ came into the picture. When you don't know who you are now. And when you don't know what you have, you can't grow. And that's why God desires that his children know. Because it is in knowledge, it is in the acquisition of knowledge that they want, they grew. As long as the children remain ignorant, the devil and his forces will take advantage of them. Are you getting it? But he understands that when we grow and we know what we have and who we are, we will now stand rightly to do his good work. We will stand rightly to be who he wants us to be and exercise the things he wants us to exercise and take charge of what he wants us to take charge of. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But my standing here tonight is 
to encourage you and to reassure you of your faith in Christ Jesus. Because I know that all of us here, we have faith in Christ Jesus. We believe the Son of God. We believe that God raised him from the dead. And we make the good confession that he is our Lord and our Savior. I believe I'm talking to the right audience. Hmm? We have that belief, right? Yes, sir. We have that common belief, is it not? Yes, so if you have that common belief, and if you don't, I believe that at the course of this meeting, the Lord will stir it up in your heart, and He will bring you to that place of disbelief, that you also will have this belief in the name of Jesus. Amen. But for all of us that have this belief, my assignment tonight is to reassure you of this belief that you have. Your belief is still intact as long as you still believe. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is still intact. Now, just like uh, the Colossian Christian, because we're going to be studying the book of Colossians tonight, this will be the first time I will truly be seeing myself in Scripture. I've been seeing things in scripture, but to be frank with you, this is the first time I'm seeing myself in scripture. Because you know when a man of God is preaching, I said, this man of God is talking to me. This man of God is talking, it's like he just came and he was just talking to me. That was how when I was reading Colossians, I realized that Paul was actually talking to me. It was like I was one of those Colossian Christians that Paul wrote that letter to. Praise the Lord. Because I realized that the situation or the position that this Colossian Christian wear is the same position I found myself. And it's the same position I, I discovered that a lot of Christians are in. And what is this position? It is a position whereby we are contending with evil passion and desires. And this evil passion and desire make us to doubt our faith in Christ Jesus. It makes us to doubt if we are still members of God's family. It makes us to doubt if we are still Christians. It makes us to doubt if we are still children of God. It makes us to doubt if we are still sons of God. And in the position of that doubting, we are also wondering how we can help ourselves with those evil passions and desires. Praise God. Hallelujah. And then in this book, Paul now wrote to them to assure them, first of all, that that doesn't mean that your faith has been twisted. It doesn't mean that you have you've been taken out of God's family. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your faith. He assures them of their faith. And then he now helped them. He now brought a solution to help them with that struggle. To tell them that it is not by rules that you give yourself that will help you overcome those evil desires and passion. Ten ways to stop masturbation. Ten ways to stop masturbation. I will not, I will not go to WhatsApp again. I will not go to Facebook again. I will not, um, I will, I will, I will not go to, I will not watch Nigerian movies again, I will not watch American movies again. All of the rules that we set to help us overcome those evil passions and evil desires. And then Paul now told them that those rules you give yourself, or some people can insist on keeping those rules. Some people tell you you have to discipline yourself to keep those rules, otherwise you will not be able to overcome them. He told them that all of those things will not help you. They don't have any help in themselves to overcome those evil desires. And what did he do for them? He now presented Christ to them. And so while I was studying Colossians, my direction now changed. Instead of just looking for the desire of God, how Christ fulfilled this desire, and who I am, and what I have, I now have to include who Christ is. Because when I know Christ, then problems are solved. 
When I know Christ, he deals with those evil passions and desires. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that is the reason for writing Colossians. That was just the reason why Paul wrote Colossians to the Christians, to the church at Colossus, to encourage them that they are still members of God's family. That they are not under the authorities of the powers of darkness. They are not. All they needed to do was to know Christ the more. All they needed to do was to enjoy him the more. All they needed to do was to enjoy his love the more. That is just all. It is in knowing Christ that they will be able to do away with their sinful passion and desires. Not by those rules that they were trying to keep. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I realized something about God while I was waiting this afternoon to come here. I was trying to compare the old and now. The old covenant and the new covenant. Try to compare the old times and this time that we're in. And I realized when these people disobey, God showed them his anger. That is the people I'm talking about, I'm talking about, excuse me, the people of God. Are you getting my point? I'm talking about the people of God. I'm not talking about those that are outside. I'm not talking about the unbelievers. I'm talking about those that believe. That's why when I said it, I said, I hope I'm talking to the right audience. Those who have the same belief. Is it not? Now, now that I'm talking about the people of God, you know, in the past, I'm referring to the Israelites now. Are you getting my point now? Now, the Israelites, whenever they disobey, they face the wrath of God under the whole covenant. Whenever they disobey, they face the wrath of God. But in the new covenant, Do you know what God does for us? He shows us more of his love. <laughs> In the covenant, when they disobey, he will show them his rod. The rod is to bring them back on track. Is it not? It's to bring them back on track. That's why most times we see them when they neglect God and they begin to serve other idols and then God will now give them to someone who will punish them very well. You know sometimes when your parents want to punish you and they can't stand the punishment, they will just call your lesson teacher and say, come my bear, help me flood this speaking very into stubborn. That was how God was doing to them. He will call someone who is good at that. They are enemy. They are so-called enemy. To torment them very well. That's when you see when God will allow the, uh, like in the time of Job, uh, when we, you know, it was during that time you see where they were doing a lot of, like, they were playing up and down, they were going up and down, they were going up and down, they were going up and down like that. When their judge is alive, you see that they are very beautiful. When their judge dies, they will go back to their evil ways. When their judge is alive, they will be good people. When God now brings that, that was how they were doing. So now, God most times gives them over to their enemies to come and torment them, to teach them a lesson, just to help them get to their senses. And when they do get to their senses, what will happen? They'll begin to cry out to God for help. Is it not? They'll begin to cry out to God for help. And then God will now hear their cry and raise another judge for them. And then the judge will now come and help them to overcome those people. And then they will now be serving God again in the reign of that judge. And true, you will hear that maybe in the next 40 years or 20 years, as long as that judge was alive, they would be doing well. But when that judge died, they will now go back to their old life and continue. But in this time, if we were still under that time, we would have been going through a lot of things like that. But that's not how it is anymore. 
The Bible said, in the one we yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was the way God demonstrated his love for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. That was the way he demonstrated his love for us. And you know something? When you are not living as he expects, maybe because of the challenge of your growth, you're still growing, and then sometimes you fall, and then things like that happen. He doesn't pick it up on you and begin to show his love. He shows you his love. It makes Jesus Christ want to show up more. It makes Jesus want to show up more. Because in this new covenant, there is an agreement that has been made. responsibility to see to it in this new covenant that that law is firmly established in your heart it is his responsibility to see to it that that law take root in your heart and that's why now if anything is going wrong he wants to show up more so that you see him more. And that's why now, when anything is going wrong, he begins to picture your mind. He begins to channel your direction to him, not away from him. He wants you to see him more. Because when you see him more, it makes a difference in your life. When you see him more, you are like him. You are becoming more like him, as we know. When you see him more, you are being transformed into him. Are you saying now? So if that is the only solution for us to be transformed into him, will he want to turn away from us? Answer me. No, sir. Will he want to way away from you? No, sir. If that is the only solution for you to become like him, he will want to stand in front so that you'll be seeing him more and more. And that's why even when you fall, he will come to see Don't you get it? And that's why in Colossians 4, the poor wanted to do was to present for them more. They needed to see. Because it is when you are turning your eyes away that you will not live well. Are you seeing it now? So he the solution to the problem was just for them to see Christ no more. Praise God. Hallelujah. It was just for us to continue to see Christ the more. It is not by doing one of those things. Ten ways to not lie again. Ten ways to not steal again. It is not by those ones. Just see Christ the more. Praise the Lord. See Christ the more. When you fall, it's an indication that I need to see Christ the more. It's not an indication for you to stay back. Do you know what makes you stay back? It's the devil. Because he knows that when you see Christ the more, you would stand. Is it not? So he keeps you in guilt when you have fallen. He makes you to feel that that thing that you did that made you fall is like you are no longer a child of God anymore. Are you getting my point? So you will not begin to doubt your belief that you have. That is, it, is it true that I am a child of God? Is it true that I am saved? You understand? You will not be asking yourself that question. You will not be in doubt of your belief. That question is never for the Lord. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? That's just the message I came to present to you. It's never from the Lord, it's from the devil. Because the more you are in doubt, the more you are in view, the more your eyes are no longer in Jesus Christ. See them? Because now you are not beginning to see yourself instead of seeing Jesus Christ. And the more you are seeing yourself, what is in yourself? You will be seeing the evil nature. Is it not? You will be seeing the evil. And the more you are seeing the evil, what is happening? You are becoming more like evil. 
you get my point, people? Yes. Do you get my point? Yes. And that's why now, in this new covenant, when you fall, God wants to present himself more to you so that you see him. He wants you to see him more. Because that's the reason why he fell, because maybe your eyes were now drifting away. So he comes and he will begin to come to that position so that you see him more. I remember in um, Luke, Jesus Christ gave us a story. He said something, though I've not entered Colossians, but I've told you the summary of Colossians. But we'll enter and we'll pick out it. But let me say this thing so that it will help us understand what I'm trying to say. Jesus Christ was talking to some set of friends while he was in the temple. And he was like, um, some people died. There was a building that fell upon some people. And I'm sure some persons were asking why would such thing happen? Like some of us ask questions like, why would some persons die? This person that have been very good. Is it that I'm better than that person? You know, just questions like that. And then he told them that uh, they that are alive, the Father expect them to bear fruit. Is it not? He expect them to bear fruit. And then he told them a story about the owner of a particular land. This owner uh, gave out this land to someone to help him to till the ground and plant crops. You understand? So the farmer planted crops and vineyard, he planted all those olive trees to produce uh, fruits for wine and also for oil, like that. He planted different crops. Now, this owner of this land came to the land when it was the season where you expect to get fruit. You understand? He expected to get fruit from the land. And then he came to the land, he didn't see any fruit. He saw the trees, there were trees there, but there's no fruit. He was like, ah, which kind of this is this one? Look at the trees, they are doing very well, but they are not producing fruit. And then he was like, I'm going to cut this tree down. That is the owner of the land talking. Because he, he came several times and he didn't find any fruit in this particular these particular trees. And he said he was going to cut it down. He was speaking to the owner, uh, the farmer to cut it. Do you know what the farmer did? The farmer came and begged him more. Please, no, let's not cut it now, please. Let's give him more time. You understand? And don't worry, I will take special care of this tree. Just leave it for me. I will take special care of the, take note of that word. I will take what? Special care of the tree. I will give it enough fertilizer so that it will grow where maybe, maybe um, the thing is lacking some nutrients. I will give it enough fertilizer and let it grow where. I will even prune it. Maybe there are some branches that are not doing well. I will prune it. Let me, let me give it special attention. That was the story. Do you know what that story means? Huh? Do you know what that story means? Jesus Christ was actually referring to we in the family of God. Each God wants to put down or show you his rocks. Jesus Christ, who is the mediator of this new covenant, his blood is always before God. Saying, forgive, forgive, forgive. His blood speaks better than his blood. His blood speaks forgiveness, not vengeance. Are you hearing me? The blood of Jesus does not speak vengeance, otherwise, God would have killed all of us. If that was the essence of the blood, the blood speaks forgiveness. That's what Hebrews said. That the blood speaks better things than the blood of what? Than the blood of what? Abel. Do you know what Abel's blood was speaking? Vengeance. 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 Avenge me. Kill Cain. Do. Do you understand? That was what Cain, uh, Abel's blood was speaking. But that was not what the blood of Jesus Christ was speaking. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ reminds the father of the covenant that he has made now. So that was Jesus Christ telling the Father, no, 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 don't kill these people. Let me give them special care. Do you see why I tell you that? In this new company, it shows us more love. Let me give them special care. Let me give them more nutrients. Maybe the nutrient was not enough. <laughs> Maybe they did not hear the word enough. So he will give you more opportunities to hear the word. He will bring more pastors, more apostles, more teachers, and more prophets to come your way so that you will hear the word. So that the more you hear the word, the more you are what fertilized to what produce fruit. 
because the fruit is changed lives. Are you getting it? The fruit is changed lives. He expects you to have a different outlook now, not like when you were in the past. So he takes responsibility of your growth. He takes responsibility of your cultivation. He takes responsibility of giving you nutrients so that you grow. And then when you produce fruit, he's happy to tell the father that yes, these are my people. Hmm? I've presented them. So his responsibility is to present you to the father holy and what blameless. Because he's representing you there holy and 